Let me illustrate. A podcast series putting the spotlight on board game artists. Hello, everybody. My name is Marco Bucci. And right away, if you hear sounds of rattling in the background, that's my daughter playing. I'm recording this with her right behind me. But I am thrilled to be here. And thank you, Oliver, for having me on your blog. I've been a board game artist since, well, let's see, I got my first board game job, which was on Karmica. I would say that was 2014, let's say. I, I actually don't know exactly, but in the, the range of 2013 to 2015, uh, that's when I began on board games. But I'm a freelance artist, so I do a lot of projects, uh, most of which are actually not board games. But I got my first start on board games with Karmica, yeah, around 2014. So I became a board game artist because, well, I guess I didn't really become a, exclusively a, a board game artist. Like I said, I do uh, all kinds of projects, but I have always been a gamer and not a video gamer, specifically like a, a tabletop gamer, uh, stuff like that. I've always liked the physical, tactile stuff, board games, card games, D&D, &D, you know, that kind of thing. And, and my friends group has always been into that kind of thing as well. So, you know, for many years, I've kind of been chomping at the bit to sort of find the right project or maybe hope that the right project would find me, uh, which is exactly what happened with Karmica. The art style I'm best known for is, uh, let's call it painterly. When, when it comes to art, you can, especially with digital art, you can be very mechanical with digital tools and kind of make art that looks, let's say, photographic or somehow like really airbrushy. Or you can use digital media to go the other way and kind of mimic oil paint or acrylic or watercolor paint. And I actually began my art training with those physical mediums, uh, mostly oil. And then I moved into watercolor and like gouache from there. And then when I picked up digital, I just wanted digital to mimic the training I already had. So I, you know, I developed my own workflow that allowed uh, me to use digital media in just the same way I would use traditional media. And, it, you know, it's very brushwork oriented, painterly meaning like you can see the artist's paint strokes, the brush strokes. They're not hidden or disguised in any way. There's a lot of texture to it. Um, you know, sometimes you move the brush very quickly and scribbly and other times it's very precise. And you kind of leave that all on the surface of the painting, so to speak. And I guess I would be mostly known for that kind of style in my work. The first board game I was an artist for was Karmica, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that was just the first project where all the pieces, no pun intended, were in the right place. Um, I knew the, the creators. Uh, I was personal friends with one. And just, you know, through that person, I knew his partner. And uh, they had already made a hit game. This is Hemisphere Games, by the way. They, they had made a hit game called... Osmos and uh, this Karmica was their follow-up. Osmos was a digital game like it was for iPad and this was their follow-up game, uh, a physical card game and I had a lot of faith in them. I knew they were kind of perfectionists um, and that's a good thing when it comes to designing board games, trust me. Uh, they would do a lot of play testing and things like that and I also knew that um, they would allow me to kind of do what I wanted with the art as the two creators of Karmica were not artists themselves. So I'm I'm really proud of the work I did on Karmica. I wouldn't I don't know if it's the most proud I am of the work. Maybe in a way it is because I was able to really uh, let's say like spearhead the vision for the art. Uh, the creators really let me do my thing, and Karmica has a a cohesive look as a result. You know, it's just it was just me. Well, that's not it wasn't just me. Uh, they did hire an artist to do a, to do one of the pieces of the game, but that artist uh, Lane Brown is his name. Lane was only hired after the game was well under production because I actually wasn't available to do um, the, the leaderboard, the scoreboard that Karmica uses. But all the cards were completed. The box cover was completed and I did all that. So the, the vision was just very unified kind of by default because I was the only one doing it. And I, I am proud of that. I'm also proud of um, some of the larger, well, let's say like more mainstream stuff I've done. I'm doing work for Wizards of the Coast on, you know, Magic the Gathering, which of course a lot of people know about. Uh, it's a heavily popular product. And I'm proud that um, I'm also able to bring my own artistic voice to those projects as well. And that's, again, the cool thing about working for games is it seems like they really foster someone's unique identity as an artist. Whereas I've, I've also done work for, say, like animation studios on television shows. And with that, you really have to blend in. you got to be a cog in the wheel. They don't want you to call attention to yourself visually. Whereas with games, it's the total opposite. So there's a lot of there's a lot to be proud of when you work in this industry. I'd say that I like creating artwork that uh, evokes a mood, really. And what that mood is can be totally variable. 
Uh, it could be something as simple as just like happiness or or maybe even sadness, something simple like basic emotion like that. Or maybe something that recalls childhood. That's a big theme of mine, just remembering back to what I imagined the world to be as a kid and like, you know, embodying that with uh, characters like monster characters or children characters or, you know, pets or whatever it is, like the things that you thought the world was like when you were a kid. Things are, you know, bigger and uh, in some ways better or more promising and i like trying to capture that you can even do it with like lighting and color so uh i like creating artwork that captures that kind of thing you know that kind of mood i get my inspiration from real life really i love to paint outdoors in a sketchbook that's where the raw information is is from nature so you know i'll stop at the side of the road and paint a barn that just has some nice light hitting it for me it's always about the light because the light creates the color and creates the mood. Um, I'm not drawn to any particular subject over another subject. I mean, I've literally painted garbage cans on the curb if the light is is hitting it just right. Um, so really, I carry my sketchbook around with me a lot because you never know when you're going to catch a scene like that. So the most important part about making artwork for board games, like the most important, I guess, facet of that process is the really the communication with the designers. Uh, this is assuming, of course, that you as the artist are not the designer of the game. Really just talking to the designers, um, seeing what the intent of that piece of the game is, you know, but whether it be a card or a token or a, a board, you know, the underlying board. What is it that that piece of gameplay does mechanically? Like, what is it that it does mechanically? And then your art needs to plug into that. So, you know, sometimes you want the art to be almost not even noticeable like like if you're playing a uh, if, if your game has like a backing board maybe it's less important for the art to really no it's a bad example let's say like let's say you're doing a token like a gold token probably the artwork doesn't really have to call attention to itself for a gold token but if you're doing like a card that's a character you want that art to really pop forward so you know talking to the game designers making sure that you're aligned on that kind of thing is i'd say the most important part the most challenging part of making artwork for board games is probably the sheer amount of uh, time it takes. And it because there's, you know, the amount of items you're doing artwork for are, are vast. Uh, unlike, say, an illustration for a magazine where it's just like you're doing one piece of art. It's an illustration. For a board game, like for Karmica, I mean, how many were cards were there? There was... I think it was in the 30s, and that's on the low end. Like, if you're doing a game, like a board game, you might have, like, 50 cards and 10 different tokens and a board and, like, pieces of the board that detach. Uh, there's, like, a, the manual, the game manual. There's so many items on uh, doing artwork for a board game. And to me, that is easily the most challenging part. And that dovetails into the next question. The longest I ever worked on a art for a board game was uh, for Karmica. I was on that project for, I think, three years. Now it's not three years of full time. But, you know, for three years of constant time, we were going back and forth. And, you know, I would do a batch of art and they would play test with that art. And then they would get back to me with revisions. And, you know, some cards got scrapped. Some cards got redesigned altogether. And, of course, if a card gets redesigned, probably the art needs to be redone as well, right? Or they invent new cards or, like, the color coding scheme changed a bit, you know. Uh, and stuff like that, like they invented, you know, multicolored cards, kind of like in Magic the Gathering, where you have like colored themes, Karmica has that sort of thing to it, uh, red, blue and green cards. And the way that we handled that changed a little bit during the process. Uh, so that all, you know, all in all was I was on that project for about three years. Um, so in my opinion, more board game artwork should, well, I'm not, I don't want to level a Gen sort of general criticism at board game art because uh, honestly I don't really have one to begin with I think what board game art should do in general though is is be part of the world the world building so uh, for Karmica we wanted it to have a unique identity for it to feel like its own game um, maybe if I had a sort of general criticism of like the art community in, in, you know in general today is that a lot of people are using the same reference images and, you know, inspired by the same styles. And as a result, it's easy to get art that feels overly homogenized, like different artists feel like the same artist. Uh, so in art in general, and certainly for board games, too, is just try and capture the unique flavor of the project that you're on as an artist and bring a flavor that nothing else has. And uh, again, that's what we really tried hard to do on Karmica. And it really it boils down to just being yourself because yeah, 
it's cliche, but you're the only you out there. And if you have an art style that is based on who you are, you can bring that to your projects and it, it will feel unique just by default. Um, the artist whose style I admire the most is uh, probably a, a painter who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s by the name of John Singer Sargent. This is a very common answer that painters will give. He Sargent has inspired countless thousands of artists. Uh, Sargent was a portrait painter primarily, but he also did like outdoor watercolors uh, and like gouache paintings and sketches. He just really observed the world well, uh, like undeniably well, and was able to translate that into such simple brushstrokes. You know, when you see a Sargent painting, he doesn't hide the brushstrokes. Like he'll do, he'll paint someone's arm in like three strokes. And it's just, it's brilliant the way he chooses to move his brush. Um, and it's it's generally called a bravura style. That's like, I think a Latin term. It's like, you know, a bold, brave style where the the marks of the artist are, are you know, happily left on the on the canvas. And uh, yeah, so Sargent, and there are people like of his ilk, like uh, Anders Zorn or uh, Soroya is another one. These are all people that, you know, Boldini, these are all artists who lived, you know, a century ago that whose, you know, their style influences countless artists today. My favorite color is, you know, it's a, I don't have an answer to that. Well, turquoise. <laughs> but, but I know it's a funny uh, story there. I don't really know color names very well, which seems so weird because that's what I do professionally. I'm like, not only am I a painter, but I specialize in color. My wife always laughs at me because I'll be like, hey, look at that purple carpet. She'll be like, that's pink. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess it is pink. And I, I don't know color names very well. Um, I'm not colorblind either. Like, I just don't know my color names. Like, uh, you know, sometimes my wife would be like, oh, that's a nice shade of teal. And I'm like, what the heck is teal? Uh, it's just a funny thing. Painters don't think in those terms, by the way. We think about things in, like, relative degrees of color. Like, something is warmer or cooler than something. Not like, oh, that's orange, that's red. So it's a bit of a funny story there. But, uh, yeah, if I had a default color that I liked, yeah, I like turquoise. What very few people know about me is... Well, artistically, anyway, um, I actually didn't start out wanting to be a painter at all. And I started out being terrified of color. I just assumed that color was one of those things that you just needed uh, like an, a, a natural predilection for or like a uh, general eye for. And I did not have that. And uh, I thought that, uh, hey, you know, leave color for the people who are naturally good at it. I actually wanted to be an animator slash VFX artist. I was really interested in 3D and uh, visual effects because not only could I not paint and let alone knew anything about color, but I couldn't draw either. And this was back when I was a teenager and I really wanted to get into the art industry, but I couldn't draw or paint. So I'm like, well, let's let's get into 3D. And um, this was back around 1995 when Toy Story had, had just come out. Also the video game uh, Myst. And uh, Myst is one of my favorite games of all time. And it, its sequel, Riven, is my favorite game of all time. And those all were done with 3D, you know, that and like Pixar films. And I'm like, this is naive and, and incorrect of me to think, but I'm like, hey, if you're doing art on the computer, you don't need to know how to draw, which that is true, but it's, I think, better if you do know how to draw. So um, what a lot of people don't know about me, just if you looked at my portfolio, is I actually started off wanting just to do like computer art and visual effects. Uh, that switched for me when I learned that you could learn how to draw and paint. And that's what led me to discover a love for drawing. And then that led me to discover a love for painting. And uh, once, I got the, once I got the taste of painting and that the fact that I could learn to do it, um, it was all game over from there. I was going to be a painter. So if you wanted to become a board game artist yourself, I would tell you to, well, work obviously work on your portfolio. Make sure your art is at a, at a place where, you know, it is professional or at the very least competent and then reach out to video um, or sorry, board game creators because, hey, uh, so many people out there are kickstarting or just, you know, doing a little project with their friend and, and designing a board game. Like I, I know a couple different people right now who are trying to come up with board game ideas and hey, those people will all need artists, uh, assuming they're not artists themselves. But generally speaking, uh, a lot of people out there are uh, board game creators that are not artists and they need artists so reach out you know put a, a little advertisement up on reddit maybe or go on reddit or kickstarter and see who's out there and just send them an email say hey i'm so and so and here's my website and i'm looking for experience and work in the game you know board game industry and i hear you're designing a game what do you think of my art you think it's a good fit if so let's talk and then you know you can 
I'm not saying you should do it for free, although maybe maybe you do want to do it for free. That's that gets into a whole different discussion. But um, see what they're up to. And if the project feels right for you, then I think uh, kind of taking it upon yourself to put your name out there is the way to go if you want to be a board game artist. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank Oliver for having me on his blog. It uh, means a lot that you reached out to me, and I hope uh, listeners out there are enjoying this little podcast. Um, If you want to get in touch with me, you can, well, first of all, you can find me on my website at www.marcobucci.com. That's M-A-R-C-O-B-U-C-C-I.com. If you're interested in learning about art, I have a YouTube channel full of ton- lots of, you know, many hours of free lessons on there. That's uh, youtube.com slash Marco Bucci. And then if you like that and you want to learn even more and dive deeper with art lessons, I have some premium lessons available on my store. And that's at marcobucciartstore.com. So you can find me at those three places. And uh, you can, my email address is marco at marcobucci.com if you want to send me a little note. Uh, and that's how you can reach me. So yeah, thanks again for having me, Oliver. And, and thank you out there for listening. I wish you all the best with your work. This podcast was made possible by the generous help of my Patreon supporters. Royal Patron, Sean Newman. Castle Guard, David Miller. Dice Masters, Alex Bardi, Paul Grogan and James Naylor. And Shining Lights, Robin Kay, Sarah Reed, Tim Vernick and Wiener Wizards.